One of the exciting things that we're doing with the summit um, over the next day and a half is bringing together practitioners and advocates who work on health equity as well as policy analysts and advocates who focus on pay and wealth inequities. And oftentimes, these two areas uh, may not be working together. And one of the things that we're doing with the summit is, is bringing together advocates and practitioners who are working on these two issues that intersect and really trying to help us to think about um, how pay and wealth inequity really is a health equity issue. And so we wanted to start off the, the summit really thinking about, you know, what is health equity and what are the social determinants of health, essentially to do some, some level setting. I want to acknowledge Sade who just joined us. Thank you. So much of our conversation will be centered on the theme of intersectionality and cross-sector collaborations over the next few days because it's so important for us to make headway in addressing disparities in health and wealth, and we need to better understand how these issues intersect and how our differential experiences shaped by gender, race, ethnicity, class, geography, and other social determinants of health can create and maintain inequities, but can also help us point the way to policy solutions that can close uh, gaps and increase access to opportunities that uh, improve and enhance health and economic well-being for women, families, and communities. So I wanted to start off by sharing the definition that we at Allies for Reaching Community Health, health Equity use for health equity. We state that health equity means ensuring fair opportunities for everyone to lead healthy and long lives by eliminating the barriers to or addressing the fundamental conditions necessary for achieving good health, especially among populations that have experienced cumulative disadvantage or stigma. So I'd love for us to start with each of our panelists sharing a bit about your work and how health equity and gender equity fits into the, 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 the work that you do. Marjorie. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Very, very happy to, to be here with, with all of you. And, um, and thank you so much, uh, Judy, for this opportunity as well. At the um, NAACP, as many of you likely know, we have a number of issue areas, if you will, that we focus on. And um, certainly economic and community development is one, um, health is another. I happen to, to head the, uh, the health work and the question such as you've posed it is especially uh, interesting, if you will, and, and telling uh, for our organization. So on the one hand, as we look at the, the challenges, if you will, that we faced in terms of both our health outcomes uh, for African Americans in particular, but uh, for other communities that are also underserved uh, by the healthcare system, the reality is that the challenges are within the overall healthcare system and are certainly connected to the broader factors, if you will, that wind up shaping uh, the, the, the health experiences, if you will, that people have. And so as we, in our work um, on the health, uh, with, within the health team, uh, look at these issues, we actually have sought to address not just the limitations, if you will, that influence people's behaviors and their personal choices, but obviously looking at what are the drivers behind those choices and how it is that we can make changes at, uh, at a higher level, right? That would be beneficial for a broader range of people. Obviously, policy, public policy in particular, is a, is a, uh, a very useful, uh, obviously, tool for that and really was ultimately designed for that purpose. And so one of the things that we're doing, in addition to looking at some of the challenges around some particular disease states, um, is that we are, we're doing two things. One, we're working with our affiliates um, all around the country to encourage them to become much more intentional um, and skilled at looking at the, the drivers, the, the social drivers, if you will, the systemic drivers to health disparities and being able to address them uh, through policy changes. And what's interesting, what's been really telling for us is that across all of the programmatic areas that we have, we found that a lot of our affiliates and let's be clear, they're all volunteers, right? So the only people at the NAACP who are actually staff are the people at the headquarters office in Baltimore. Everyone else that you hear about all around the country, they're actually volunteers. So they actually have other work that they do on a regular basis. And this is literally work of passion that they do on top of their regular work. But what we found is that when it comes to health, and this is probably not going to be surprising to many of you, 
they are especially accustomed to looking at it from a behavioral standpoint. So what they've been especially um, used to and focused on is really thinking about, well, what do we do to improve people's behaviors? What, are, what, what do we do to you know, kind of create some more opportunities even for people to make better decisions? <laughs> but what has not been as um, focused in their efforts has really been to think about both health policy solutions as well as health and social policy solutions. So we're really working to build their ability to be part of those efforts and those conversations so that they can have um, a more impactful uh, voice and role both in, for themselves, obviously, for the association on the local level, but also for engaging community residents, right, um, around this kind of work. That's one part. The other piece is that over the past year or so, year and a half maybe in particular, we've been thinking about what it is that we need to do within the association to create more intersectional work opportunities and thinking about solutions from a more intersectional way within uh, the work of the association itself. So one example is that um, within the, the economic development team, there are a series of report cards that they've been producing for a number of years that look at a variety of issue areas. And when I started at the association just two years ago, there was one that had come out um, that was actually looking at the uh, healthcare sector and looking at how uh, the healthcare sector created opportunities for advancement through the, um, the C-suite by really increasing diversity within the upper echelons of the healthcare system. What was interesting, of course, is that because it's the, it's the econ team, they were looking at it from the standpoint of what it meant in terms of being able to create greater opportunity, economic opportunity within communities because uh, the reality is that the healthcare sector in and of itself is a big driver of employment opportunities. Uh, both for individuals and for small businesses in a lot of communities. What we recognize from the health standpoint is that it also could potentially make a big difference if we could increase diversity, right, in leadership in healthcare. It would create a, a different conversation in terms of what healthcare actually meant. So in terms of what the healthcare systems would actually be focusing on, uh, what the issues are that they'd be focusing on, the quality of the care, and looking at some critical issues within the healthcare system in and of itself that could also in improve health. So that was, you know, one small way, if you will, and we've had, you know, some conversations uh, with a, a variety of, um, of uh, players in the healthcare system that way. So it's been very uh, challenging, but at the same time exciting for us to recognize that even within the work that we do, it's really important for us to be very intentional about bo um, both talking about and thinking solutionally about the, the, the issues from um, intersectional ways. Thank you, Marjorie. You touched on a number of themes that we'll be coming back to, including community engagement and how do we, can, how do we turn the lens internally in terms of being more intentional about thinking intersectionally across um, different departments within our organization and in subject matter areas. Dr. Blumenthal. Thank you so much, Dr. Lubin, for moderating this panel and to, uh, for the extraordinary leadership of Dr. Maya Rockamore for her work uh, in, in women's uh, health equity and wealth equity. Thank you very much. Well, you know, until just two decades ago, women's health was neglected in the halls of public policy, at the research bench, and in clinical settings. When uh, there were no women's health reports, there were no women's health conferences like this, there were no women's health fellowships or centers. When you conducted research, most of the subjects were male. Even the rats used in most laboratory experiments were male. Um, yet the findings were extrapolated to guide treatment and prevention decisions for women. When we educated about preventing HIV AIDS or heart disease or lung cancer, it was all targeted to men. And uh, when we um, you know, thought about um, service delivery, uh, again, the service model was to men. When we educated uh, a generation of healthcare providers, men were considered to be the generic humans. They never went through, went through menopause or had ovarian cancer. So you can see that there were tremendous gaps in terms of women's health equity. Well, I'm very proud to have served as the country's first Deputy Assistant Secretary for Women's Health, appointed in 1993. Um, I worked with uh, the agencies of our, our federal government to weave a focus on women's health into the fabric of those agencies' missions for res research and services and prevention. And, um, and to work with the private sector to do the same, and to move women's health to the forefront of our nation's healthcare agenda. 1993, a law was passed that said women must be included in clinical trials, and women and minorities must be included, or, or that research study won't be funded. 
Fast forward today, women now comprise about 57% of clinical trial participants. However, we still don't have transparency by disease or by institute. It was only last year that uh, regulations were passed that those rats should include female subjects and cellular subjects. So it took that long to really uh, ensure that there was equity in the, in the research system. You know, when we, when we talk about um, the sociocultural determinants of health, uh, they're, they're so critical. A paper was, pa was, uh, was published about 15 years ago that looked at the um, actual causes of death, because we know that the leading causes of death for women are heart disease and, and stroke and diabetes and, and lung cancer, and now Alzheimer's disease. But the actual causes of death were smoking and obesity, lack of physical activity. Well, just in 2011, uh, a, there was a, another meta-analysis that was published in the American Journal of Public Health that showed that one-third of deaths in America today are related to socioeconomic determinants of health. So to our income, education level, racial discrimination, housing issues, uh, and other barriers to health. And so I think that this conference today really is so critical because, like Ralph Waldo Emerson, the poet said, the first wealth is health. They are so inextricably intertwined. And while we worked to really improve uh, women being uh, participating in research and making sure that when we educated about preventing HIV or um, heart disease, now women are a focus of those efforts. But one critical element that was missing until 2010 was access to health care. Women could be charged more for a health care plan. Um, they, we had many, many uninsured women, and, and I hope we'll get a chance to, to talk about that too. But, uh, you know, your income and your education level are the most critical predictor of health. Every step down the income and education level takes you up steps in terms of premature death and disability from disease. And this, again, there, uh, there are, there's, there's no one solution, I believe firmly, in a health and all policies approach. Health cannot be confined to a clinic or to a hospital, but rather you need smart agricultural, transportation, foreign policy. All of these factors impact on health today. Thank you. Uh, so I, I am, uh, first of all, very grateful and humbled for the opportunity to share my work and perspective here. Um, and it's also incredibly refreshing to be in conversation with this many women. Uh, I spend a lot of my time in Silicon Valley. And uh, in terms of some of the statistics that, um, that, that um, Admiral was uh, referring to, we are, we have a long, long way to go in terms of where investment capital is headed. And so just, uh, I'll, I'll put that out there, but just to take a step back and describe our work at Food System 6, we run cohorts of game-changing, transformational entrepreneurs in both the for-profit and the nonprofit sector that are transforming how we grow, produce, and distribute food. So we have um, a, a very broad and diverse mandate, uh, and uh, we also see some absolutely critical efforts that are historic, have historically been overlooked in the investment community as they relate to the food system and where we see investment absolutely needing to be, to be directed. So we do our, our very best to identify and surface and support the kinds of entrepreneurs that are out there um, that may not look like what uh, a Silicon Valley investor is typically in, you know, seeing in terms of the deals that pass his desk, and I'll use that very explicitly. Um, so we see some critical barriers to health in terms of food access. Um, I, think, I don't think I need to explain to anybody in this room how absolutely vital it is to have access to healthy, fresh, culturally appropriate foods, and it is not the case right now. Uh, we also see a really critical area, as I mentioned, in terms of where investment capital is headed and the statistics around who is and is not getting funded. Um, you know, we've got uh, women founders are currently representing between 10 and 15 percent of venture capital funding. Uh, and the last statistic is that there are 7 percent of investors uh, who are women. Um, so uh, the work that we do is very squarely designed to disrupt that and to, 
to, again, surface the kinds of entrepreneurs that we think need the investment capital, the resources, the knowledge, and the assets that can help them in turn support their communities. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about who we are and how we function and the areas that we um, in particular are interested in. So we are coming at it from supporting founders. We also um, have a very strong internal mandate to inform and educate the kinds of entrepreneurs that we work with who may not be coming from these types of communities or tackling these types of issues, but who are poised and positioned and are growing and will be the future of the food system. And it's really important to us that those teams hear about the inequities in our food system and how they as founders um, in a very, very hot area uh, in, in food and agriculture are needing to integrate these elements into the businesses that they are building. And that takes many forms, um, not the least of which is how they build their boards and the types of investors that they bring to the table and the way that they hire. Um, so, you know, we're, we're definitely taking a very intersectional and cross-sector approach, um, but we're all about focusing on um, bringing the right kinds of entrepreneurs the resources that they need, and then educating and working with the, the future food and agriculture leaders of our country. Um, and the good news is, um, there's, there's, there's a lot of bad news out there, but the good news is um, it, the work that we are doing has attracted a really wide range of interest um, because people understand that there's, there's a, a business imperative. Um, as more and more research comes out of reputable <laughs> institutions uh, like Harvard Business School around how um, businesses that are thinking about diversity and inclusion in their hiring um, outperform uh, their peers. Um, so I don't think anybody in this room was waiting for the study from Harvard to indicate that um, women on boards and women in leadership and investing in women founders was uh, the way that it needed to be. Um, but the, there, there are, are tides that are turning and they're turning in our favor. So I'm really excited to be here sharing my work and learning from leaders in the field. Um, thank you all. I'm really excited to also be learning and building with everyone in this room and also on this panel. Um, in alignment with uh, what some of my colleagues shared in terms of values, um, we are approaching this work um, through housing. And so, you know, speaking of intersectionality, we look at how, um, you know, the intersections of race, class, and gender um, impact people, particularly living, those living in public housing. And so for the past um, four years now, we've been working um, through uh, methods around community-based participatory research. So as Marjorie was talking about um, community engagement, we've definitely been doing that, um, looking at sexual health and sexual safety, um, building an intervention with um, household, uh, households that live in a very, um, socially isolated and race segregated uh, community in the District of Columbia. Um, and it took us about a year to build the initial community buy-in. As you know, you never wanna go into a particular community and say, you know, when you look at the census data and when you look at all of these different disparities, you all are here <laughs> compared to everyone else. And so we wanted to be very thoughtful with how we approached um, various uh, community leaders. Um, after doing that, we were successful at uh, getting a lot of buy-in to, one, build um, an intervention. Um, it was definitely a new effort for my organization at the Urban Institute to build an intervention from the ground up. Of course, we used um, existing evidence-based uh, approaches and strategies to build this intervention, but it was definitely born out of uh, those community leaders, their needs, as well as um, making sure that it was culturally appropriate um, and responsive to their needs. And so we built a sexual health and safety curriculum from the ground up with them. And then we um, spent a lot of time doing train the trainer models to make sure that it wasn't just a service provider who had access to the information in that curriculum, but it was trusted adults and caretakers who would stay in that community even outside of you know traditional nine to five hours 
or whenever the uh, curriculum would actually be implemented so that they could be the brain trust of that and um, actually sustain the programming. Um, and so that is something that we've been focused on for a really long time and some of the outcomes associated with that curriculum um, as well as the train the trainer model is to uh, reduce unintended pregnancy, to make sure that there is access, that people understand and have access to uh, family planning options. Um, and so I, I forget which one of my colleagues were talking about changing behaviors, I believe it was Marjorie. Um, when you think about a curriculum, it's definitely, especially a youth-based curriculum, it's definitely reading, we're trying to reduce risky behaviors, right? But another really key important element of doing this work is making sure that folks have access to leaders who have um, the, who are positioned to make changes and to make sure that uh, their voices are being heard. Right in the middle of building this curriculum, the one of the Planned Parenthood uh, facilities was closed. And so that's clearly counterproductive to not only our work, but also making sure that families have access to very needed um, healthcare resources. And so um, in addition to the curriculum, in addition to making sure that adults are trained and can um, sort of reinforce the messaging of, of that curricula, we really prioritize um, advocacy. So making sure that heads of the housing authority are at the table and hearing directly from their residents about how their health is being impacted, how their neighborhood safety is being impacted as a result of very structural issues. Um, and so that is something that we've been working on for, like I said, four years, and fortunately, we have recently were um, given a grant. I don't know how everything's going to shake out given this current in administration, but um, we were also recently given a grant through um, uh, HHS to actually do a quasi-experimental design to actually um, unpack and zoom in on very specific elements of this program to see what works so that we can um, hopefully make sure that this is not just um, you know, built to scale, but also something that various housing contexts and place-based initiatives could sort of benefit from. Great, thank you. Um, so, so you've shared a little bit about your work, and I'd like for us to come back um, in a few minutes to talk, talk a little bit more specifically about some of the things that you're doing. But I wanted to talk a bit more about the social determinants. Some of you have already identified um, housing and racism and, and education as key social determinants. When we talk about the social determinants of health, we often say that these are the conditions in which people live, born, work, and play, right? So these, these could, this could include housing, it could include transportation, um, poverty and other determinants, factors that we know that shape the life experiences of populations and communities. And so I'm, I'm wondering um, for our panelists, you know, what are some of the key determinants that um, you're working on or that you think are essential as we're having this conversation around um, health equity? What are those key determinants that we should be paying attention if we're paying attention to, particularly as we're thinking about improving um, not only um, health outcomes, but um, economic opportunity for women and families? Okay. Oh, yeah. I'll, go, I'll go ahead and, and, and start. Uh, as, I, well, as I mentioned, um, at, the, at the association we have a, a number of what we call game changer areas, which, which won't be surprising, um, I think, to, to most of you. So obviously we're, we're focused on, uh, on health, which again, you know, goes beyond the, the healthcare uh, system per se and the challenges within the, the system, uh, but also is um, ultimately focused on the experiences that people are also having within within the system and the you know sort of unpacking that part uh, we were also looking at you know economic and community development like you talked about we also are looking at um, the differential experiences that uh, people have is again in particular people of color have with the educational system and what is being done around educational reform what kind of solutions are really being um, posited if you will to reform the system in theory in ways that will really help to get at advancing not just academic achievement, but really increasing opportunities for success. And what we're finding by and large is that it's very difficult to make a good case for the, um, the, the sort of indirect privatization, if you will, I'll call it that, um, of the healthcare system that's really happening, the extent to which it's really going to, to lead to, the, to those kinds of, of outcomes. As the evidence is, is fairly clear that, um, you know, frankly, it's not, certainly not the way it's, it's being constructed now. One of the other um, 
key areas, though, that I, I have to underscore. I, I do represent the NAACP. Um, and it, it really is around um, um, civil rights and in particular voting rights. There's a, the conversation, this conversation that we're having here and that we'll be having over the you know, course of the next um, 24 hours or so, we can't undermine or under recognize the value of people, one, both understanding these issues and being able to talk about their experiences and feeding into solutions in a way that, is, that has meaning and that has uh, value and that ultimately enables them to be able to speak out and have a voting, um, a, a representation, if you will, that, that, that uh, maximizes their, their voting ability. And when that in and of itself winds up getting undermined, that in and of itself not just under, you know, sort of uh, removes, you know, the, the, the baseline, if you will, of what forms our, our democracy, but only helps to strengthen the disparities, the inequalities that we're seeing and, and really removes uh, people's power. And so there is, um, as you'll see, a big uh, focus that the association it has on um, protecting voting rights in this country and really um, getting Voting Rights Act secured, um, you know, reinstituted, if you will, and, and secured in this country. And that is actually the rationale behind that. For, for those of us, you know, who don't think about this, who have not had the, the, the experiences, that some people in this country have every single time that they go to vote. It's something that we don't fully appreciate, but it's actually a very important component um, of this conversation. And certainly, as we're thinking about, again, how do we advance our work in more intersectional ways, we also want, and you know, we're certainly talking about the role that um, uh, communities and community leaders have in shaping uh, public policy. We can't help but think, you know, we really have to make sure that this conversation is, or that piece, if you will, is, is really inculcated in the conversation the way it should be. Yeah, thank you for mentioning the importance of civil rights and, and voting rights, um, because especially if we're, as we're thinking about health equity, really being able to achieve health equity, we need to think at the policy and systems and environmental change level. And you know, we're in the process now of seeing what the outcomes are of an election and looking at the repeal of the Affordable Care Act that has helped to um, significantly increase access to health care, access to health coverage, right? And so this is very much civil rights, civil engagement is very much a part of the conversation around health equity. Mm -hmm. I, I want to underscore your powerful point. I think that, um, again, women are 50% of the population and at older ages are the majority of the population by considerable proportion. And women need to use their powerful voices to uh, have their expression of the policies they care for known. Um, this was very true in bringing women's health to the fore. It was women scientists, women journalists, you know, women, a uh, few women politicians that we had then that worked together to expose those shameful inequities in women's health. And again, the economy. I mean, women make 70 cent, 79 cents on the dollar that white men earn. Black women make 64 cents on the dollar that white men earn and uh, Latina women make 54 cents on the dollar that a white man earns. So these economic inequities, you know, tie into uh, educational issues, tie into poverty, um, and, uh, and, and also I think, you know, tie into the shameful health disparities that exist for, um, for black and uh, Hispanic women in our country today with higher rates of infant and maternal mortality, HIV AIDS, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and some forms of cancer. The, the, these gaps need to be closed. These disparities are, uh, cannot no longer be tolerated. And, um, and I think that, again, this is the goal, is to really um, to, to entwine the, the social determinants and address those structural barriers um, with health. And, and I think that we will see an improvement in, in health um, if, if, we can, if we can look at ways to boost um, income, education levels, also childcare. Uh, we just had a discussion at New America today on uh, reforming childcare and family policy, uh, po family leave policies. I mean, with the aging of the population, there are going to be more women who then are caregivers and also affected by uh, degenerative diseases of the, of the brain, like Alzheimer's. 
and then childcare uh, with more women in the workforce and more single moms. I mean, we need a transformation. Just as we transformed our healthcare system, we need a transformation in our social uh, system that provides the support that women and families need uh, to lead healthy lives. Um, I thank you and, and certainly um, echo and support what my, my colleagues have said. Um, it, in terms of healthy food access and the relationship that that access to healthy foods, culturally appropriate, um, fresh foods bears, I mean, I, you know, it, there's, it's clear that there's a significant and strong impact on health, um, you know, and a lot of the built environment and the infrastructure around our current food production system is not designed um, in a way that can um, achieve impact on some of the disparities that we see. Um, however, uh, there are a number of very promising both place-based efforts and um, state efforts, state policy efforts that uh, we believe are poised to have a significant impact on increasing access to these types of foods. Uh, one of those that I'd like to highlight is uh, the Good Food Purchasing Program. So this is a program that um, began in Los Angeles and the ultimate goal is to help redirect uh, institutional uh, procurement, so schools, universities, hospitals, um, the kind of you know anchor institutions and community to align their food purchasing um, in a values-based way. Uh, it's an incredibly comprehensive program, um, a very rigorous set of guidelines, and it absolutely includes making sure that those purchasing programs are focused on uh, all the right target markets and also on the right types of producers. Um, there are similarly, uh, and, that, and that program is poised to expand, and Chicago recently adopted that set of guidelines. I mean, their, their pipeline of cities and institutions that are, are really interested in adopting these policies and programs um, is quite robust. They're poised to impact um, 2.2 million meals a day um, in ways that are truly, uh, you know, have the have true potential to be transformative in terms of the food that is being um, served in these important institutions where many children and many women uh, are in, interacting in a daily basis. Um, so I would definitely um, point to that as as a as a rising star in this um, landscape, and uh, the fact that it's state based too. I think just you know provides an extra um, layer of promise uh, right now. Um, and there are an unbelievable number of social enterprises that are in places like Tulsa and Gainesville and, um, and I've got my list here, Philadelphia, Oakland, um, that are working to, the, the fancy word is disintermediate the food system, but basically what that means is getting more money back into the hands of the growers and the producers um, as opposed to more of the, the middlemen in the system. And so there's, there's an incredible amount uh, of very promising work happening at that level. Um, and much of that is focused on tapping underserved growers and producers and making strong and vital connective tissue relationships to similarly underserved communities. Um, so there are a few in that, in that bucket I'll call out our Mandela Marketplace in Oakland, uh, Common Market, which is in Philadelphia, but expanding to Atlanta and other cities. Um, and again, there is, there's this, um, they're all aggregation efforts and distribution efforts that have a particular focus on um, creating a social impact in their, in their moving goods and products for both the producers and the communities that they serve. And, as I mentioned earlier, has the added benefit of being um, very attractive to others in the industry who understand how important it is for, in particular, the millennial consumer, gets a lot of conversation in, in my world, um, driving, uh, purchasing towards foods and food products that have meaning and authenticity and integrity. So there's, there's a, a phenomenal opportunity right now where these worlds are coming together. Um, I'll also note some of the efforts that are happening on indigenous lands and on First Nations in terms of their production and there are some significant policy and regulatory challenges in terms of social enterprise scaling on native lands. Um, but I, so I think there's, that's an area of certainly attention 
um, that needs to be given because there's a lot of promise on those lands right now and a lot of productive capacity. Um, so those are there are some. Uh, there there are others that you know perhaps I'll get to, but I think just in terms of thinking about the place-based opportunities in the food system that are really taking um, these structural issues and attempting to dismantle and disrupt them. Um, and the fact that they are attracting um, the kind of investment capital that they need to, to scale and succeed is, is very exciting and gives me a lot of hope uh, right now. May I just add to why food is so important? I mean, it is the essential ingredient uh, for, for a healthy life, but one out of six Americans uh, goes to bed hungry, are food insecure in America. And 70% um, of Americans are overweight or obese, leading to a risk factor for major illnesses. Uh, like uh, diabetes and, and stroke and heart disease and some forms of cancer. So having um, a healthy diet is, is critical. And unfortunately, there, again, for, for the poor, there are so many um, obstacles. To, and, you know, uh, fast food is cheaper to buy. It's cheaper to eat at McDonald's for a family of five. Uh, there are food deserts in so many areas of our, of our country. So I think trying to address the food challenges is, is a, a very important part of, of health equity today. It's nice when you have uh, a panelist who all agree with you. <laughs> um, I guess the only thing I would add to that, um, just sort of thinking about what everyone has said, the word that comes to mind is self-determination, right? And I think in order to really um, unpack what that means in, in real time, you have to make sure that you have the right people at the table. And, um, you know, we've talked at different points already about um, how women for so long weren't at the table. You know, I know everybody remembers the Institute of Medicine, um, a panel of all men deciding when and how often we needed to um, have our well check visits and things like that. I think on, the same is true for when we're building out our programs and when we're thinking about even lower uh, case P policies and, and agreements, if you will, um, you need to make sure that the people that you um, expect to participate in and benefit from your programs are helping design and shape what those programs need to look like. And it sounds like a really basic priority or point, but it's something that so often a lot of us in our in our work, just given all the deadlines and um, all of our priorities and, you know, how just the day-to-day fast-paced um, work goes, we just forget. Um, and, and it's it's not productive, it wastes money, um, and it, it's, it's shameful when you really think about it. And so that is one thing that I've been really uh, fortunate to do in my work is making sure that uh, the very people who are supposed to be benefiting from these programs are building them because there are so many blind spots that we have, um, as mentioned before, and as other people were describing, um, we often are doing this work in food deserts or places that are really isolated. And what may make sense for me, um, in theory, just doesn't doesn't work out in real time. And sometimes you have to also work within the system that you are given and do advocacy, you know, in parallel with that work. But you also have to make sure that the people who live in those areas, for example, um, can really reality check your plans. And so, um, as I mentioned earlier, we definitely have very specific health outcomes associated um, with our reproductive health um, curricula and programming. But we also, at, at a more granular level, um, really focus in on advocacy, and we have um, a lot of priorities around making sure that our program participants are not only empowered with information, but have access to decision makers um, and also um, are required to be at certain meetings and um, making sure that they're utilizing their voices and being heard when they um, do so. If I could just add really quickly, to Shade's point, that's also very true when we think about, and this is obviously part of why we're having this conversation, how it is that policies are designed. So very often, they are designed in silos, and so in terms of thinking about what the impact will be on the very people we're trying to serve, we think about them in silos. And in the process, very often, depending on the, the issue area that we're focusing on, we could have one set of policies that could actually wind up having a detrimental outcome in another area. It's happened in education, it's happened in health. Uh, you know, there are examples, you know, that I could easily give that point to this. And so, you know, I, <laughs> this is a term that I very often like to, to, to think of. We have to be focused on the end user. Ultimately, we have to think about the communities. Um, that even thinking about even from the standpoint of the individual that we're trying to serve. And, 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 and in theory, right, create better opportunity for better outcomes for. 
what does that mean then in terms of what is it that impacts them? And then how do we create models, better systems, that will serve them in a way that is not complicated, that's not cumbersome, and that really will have the desired um, outcome. You know, very often we wind up shooting ourselves in the foot and then really shoot, quite frankly, jack up, if you will, the very people that we're trying to help. And, you know, so your, your point is 100%, you know, um, correct. And it happens, you know, within the, the, the process of, of developing policies and programs, interventions all the time as well. Yeah, I love this panel because you anticipated my question around community engagement and involvement. And so just as a follow-up, I'm wondering what you found works in terms of best practices for engaging um, communities and also translating some of these issues. Um, health equity, you know, is often seen as a, a jargon, right? And, and so how do we translate these issues um, when we're doing grassroots work? One of the things that uh, we learned in the research community was that we needed to bring the end user in to, because women weren't participating in clinical trials, there were so many barriers, really had to, it was so critical to talk to women about what it was that would make it um, possible for them to, in, in, to participate in research or prevention trials. And that was childcare and transportation and uh, also, um, you know, reaching them in, in areas where where they would get the information. And, and using people, community workers, someone just like you, but who had more education about the issue, for example, to talk about mammography, rather than having a, a, a doctor come into the community and, and do that kind of discussion. So I think we've, we've learned quite a bit over the years about the importance, uh, as has been underscored, of community engagement. Uh, in order to make sure that programs are effective. And also, you know, sometimes programs that are tested in a research setting aren't going to work in the actual community setting for all the reasons that I think have been enumerated here and why it's just so important because communities keep changing that we have the input and, and keep current in understanding what the issues are for that particular community today and targeting to vulnerable groups, targeting our interventions. Not one intervention is gonna work the same way for everyone. I would also um, say making sure that you're giving the data back as a researcher um, and as many people in this room, we're used to um, going into these targeting areas and collecting data over and over and over again. And oftentimes we don't have the priority or the capacity or the money to give that data back. And I think that that is, um, that is something that we really need to do a better job of. Um, it builds capacity um, for the researcher as well as the research participants. And it also gives them an opportunity to reality check what you're doing, just like you would be at a research conference pre presenting your research and you have colleagues sort of critiquing your work so that it can be better and so that you can use that work as an advocacy tool or what have you. I think we should be able to do the same thing when we're working with um, our research participants in these targeted, very vulnerable communities. And similar to what Rinsky was saying earlier, they're not waiting necessarily for those uh, final to confirm and validate what it is that they're experiencing, but the ways in which we package it could be a lot more impactful if they have a say-so and how it's, um, how it's, those stories are told. Um, and it also empowers them to be able to use data for their own um, needs as well. And so I, I just think that sharing the data back is really important. Yeah, that's great. And I, I'd love to, uh, to highlight uh, a company um, that uh, works in the food system to tackle food waste as well as food access. And it's a company many of you in this room may have heard of. It's called Imperfect Produce. And, and the reason I'm bringing them up now in, in relation to this question is the founders of that company, um, and I'll, I'll tell you what they do if you don't already know, but the founders of that company all came from the nonprofit social sector working on both the environmental side and the farm side in terms of recognizing that a lot of food goes to waste that is a cost for farmers and growers and producers and also came from the food banking industry. Um, so, and it's, it's a former colleague of mine, I used to work at the San Francisco Food Bank, um, who had both also direct access to the kinds of information that food bank 
clients were expressing in terms of what they needed and where they needed it from a fresh fruit and vegetable perspective. So those, those two worlds came together in the founding of this company, and now Imperfect Produce um, is delivering a much lower cost, it's about 30 to 50% lower cost produce basket um, to communities. They're expanding rapidly. They started in the Bay Area, but are expanding rapidly. And from my perspective, in large part, that's due to the fact that they had been on the ground in these communities. They have been on the ground in communities of need as far as food access is concerned, and they had been building relationships and were on the ground and understood that growers also had a significant pain point. And they brought those, all that data and all that um, analysis together. And from my perspective, again, that's why they're succeeding in this space. Um, it's, it's a very challenging system right now. There's a lot of new entrants into food, but um, I contend that businesses that are formed in this way and in this manner, really having had the ear of the communities they're intending to serve, are going to end up being the most successful. And it's, it's pretty phenomenal. 30 to 50% off retail prices for fresh food delivered to your house is, is a pretty compelling uh, offering for, for many communities. So just thought I would uh, highlight that um, in relation to that question. Thank you. Before we open up uh, for q and I'm wondering if our panelists have any thoughts, given your experience and knowledge in the areas, the different social determinants that you're working on, if there are any untapped levers um, for change, be they um, policy approaches, programs, or movements that are already underway. Um, untapped levers for change or some great opportunities or maybe even some challenges for us to think about. Well, one of the things that I think is interesting, we're living in the 21st century information age, and I think looking and exploring ways of um, using digital technology, social media, to and text messaging to help. Um, I'm working currently on a project on the WIC program, which is the Women Infants Supplemental uh, Food Program. 53% uh, of infants in the United States are enrolled in WIC, and we're looking at how uh, they're moving towards the use of an electronic benefit card, how that could be turned into a nutrition education interactive card, and also to text message and give um, healthy messaging as well, piggybacking on about infant and child development um, messaging. But I, I also just want to take this opportunity to talk about healthcare, because I think that that's a really untapped lever. Well, it's a, it's a tapped lever now, and, and why it's so important for women. You know, before the Affordable Care Act, um, we had 50 million uninsured women, 50 million uninsured people, uh, half of whom were women. We had, um, we had people going bankrupt uh, every 30 seconds in America. We had um, you know, women being able to be charged more for their health insurance than men, um, that being a woman was a pre-existing condition and being denied health insurance. And women would lose their health insurance more often than men because they were part-time workers or because of divorce. Um, this changed with the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act of 2010 gave women a, a patient's bill of rights uh, where you could no longer discriminate if you had a pre-existing condition. There was free preventive services like contraception, cervical cancer screening, mammography screenings. Um, Kids could stay on their parents' insurance until age 26. It expanded Medicaid in 31 states plus the District of Columbia. And so, you know, it provided access to health insurance for so many more women. And this is life-saving because in 2009, an Institute of Medicine report said that 44,000 people died in our country because of lack of health insurance or underinsurance. So I want to underscore how important health access to health care is. Uh, to uh, women's well-being, to women's health equity, um, and let's all work uh, to make sure that it's not taken away. And just, just quickly to, to Susan's um, incredibly important point, is that that very issue is one that actually cuts across all of the um, the topics, I'll say, the areas that we're, we're going to be talking about over the next several days, this concept of prevention, right, primary prevention, such as we know it in health, is actually just as applicable in education, it's just as applicable in housing, it's just as, you know, um, um, uh, true in, in um, you know, uh, 
uh, environmental and, and, and climate justice issues, it goes straight down the line. The reality is, in terms of how it is that we address a lot of our issues, we're very reactive about it, right? That's right. Period. That's it. We need, we need to own up to that. And that's something that absolutely needs to be changed. So in terms of, uh, you know, going back to what you were saying, there, there's a lot that we know that we don't put into practice, and we need to be thinking about it from that standpoint right from the beginning. So again, if we're thinking about a lifespan, when we're looking at what it is that we do for kids, right, when they first, literally, when they're first born, and looking at how it is that we, you know, um, uh, think about the opportunities that can be presented around childcare, around education, around nutrition for kids from the beginning. And then we go, you know, uh, over to the other end and we look at how it is that we address, for example, long-term care. The reality is there's a whole lot that we're, we're failing on miserably, uh, both, you know, from a policy standpoint and from a practice standpoint, to, again, maximize the opportunity for what prevention can actually do and ultimately get us to a place where we can really optimize um, good, good health and good outcomes for people across the lifespan. And that's something that's, you know, that we, we keep missing the boat on that, and it's, it's really high time that that stops. Yeah. And I, I just, I want to underscore what you're saying, because, you know, prevention is preferable to cure, and we have a $3.2 trillion healthcare budget. We spend only 3 to 5 percent on prevention. And again, one part of the Affordable Care Act that's not well known is there was a $20 billion prevention and public health fund that was really to bring prevention services to communities around the country and that needs to be safeguarded. Uh, I, I would love to add another very complex piece of legislation into the mix here, which is the Farm Bill. Mm. Um, and uh, the absolutely critical relationship that food production has on human health. Um, there are a number of instances and a number of really incredibly important um, protections that need to be put in place and existing practices that um, really are in need of some massive retooling. Um, I think in particular around the relationship between pesticide use and chemicals in production and the relationship that that has to farm worker and farm labor health. Um, I think about, uh, I think about, um, yeah, <laughs> labor, labor laws um, that are also a part of the Farm Bill that are having a significant impact on the wages of those workers within the food system beyond the field into the restaurant and other food service industries. Um, so there are some really critical components there. Um, and then there are, you know, production elements. So for example, the um, human health implications on predominantly low-income communities of confined animal livestock operations, um, also known as CAFOs. Uh, there are an a, a, a overwhelming um, and astounding array of statistics um, around the impact that those types of production facilities are having on human health in, in these communities. Um, so those are those are the big the big scary um, items, and you know again I'm I'm quite fortunate in that in my position I get to be working and supporting uh, the entrepreneurs and the founders that are doing things differently in the food system. Um, again, I also can't understate the importance of engaging with and interacting with the private sector right now around some of these issues. Um, again, in big food and in big ag for culture. Um, they are industries that are facing um, an, uh, an existential crisis. Uh, they are trying to figure out how they can stay relevant in uh, a rapidly changing consumer demands profile um, that does put them in a position to be uh, better allies and better partners on some of the issues that everybody in this room cares deeply about and is working on. Um, so would also make, make a strong case for that, and it's something that we work on actively. Um, and then the other thing I would just absolutely encourage those of you out there, you're all leaders and you're all entrepreneurs in your own way. Um, my organization takes a very broad view and a very broad perspective of entrepreneurs and innovators and take those ideas and really roll with them and, you know, identify how your the problems that you are working to address, like do you have solutions and, and consider yourself an entrepreneur and you know, consider us an ally in your journey to become an entrepreneur and to scale the impact of what you're working on. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I would say just to um, put a fine point on it, maybe um, I again agree with what everybody has said, 
Um, but I think it's very simple, um, similar to the fact that I don't walk into a room as a black person or a woman or somebody who has you know, parents that are immigrants and are working class. I think we need to recognize that people don't enter services with one need. They walk in with all of their needs. Um, and so to really optimize prevention, I think we need to be leveraging um, and, and taking advantage of that moment when somebody walks in um, with one need or with, with all of their needs, even though you are there to address one specific need. And what I mean by that is just really um, doing more cross-sector work is what it boils down to. I think um, it's been mentioned that we really should think about how to be social entrepreneurs and how to um, merge efforts. Um, there are a lot of ways in which um, transportation and housing, for example, can pay for health. Um, we know the cost savings associated with making sure that um, women you know, in, in another life, I'm a doula. And so I know that a lot of my clients um, have so many health, I'll say inequities associated with just not being able to get to the doctor. So there's nothing wrong with them biologically, but they simply cannot get to a provider um, due to transportation issues. And um, a lot of people don't know that Medicaid, for example, pays for shuttle services and um, will, will cover some of those um, transportation needs. Um, there are some cases in DC um, as well as in um, Boston where uh, folks are working with banks and really utilizing their CRAs to make sure that they're paying for uh, co-located services where people are putting um, housing and job training and healthcare all in the same place. It's not that complicated. It's a little complicated in terms of the financing structure, but the idea, the social innovation of it is not that complicated. It's really um, until we uh, can, can really uh, have an administration that prioritizes some of these issues, we have to really leverage the opportunities that exist, and I think that that really boils down to doing more cross-sector work and making sure, again, that you are not seeing somebody as sort of one-dimensional when they come in to access um, something really making sure that you're optimizing all of those different points at which uh, somebody would need to be uh, really benefiting from preventive services. Excellent. So we have about three to four minutes for questions. We invite our audience <laughs> members, if you have any questions, I believe we have a microphone coming around. I'll be quick. Hello. Yes. Hi, my name is Angel Rich, I'm author of The History of the Black Dollar, and most people know me as a financial expert, but I actually did my college thesis on diabetes prevention and have lost uh, 100 pounds. And I went to China um, to do this and learn the information. And through that and me being a researcher, and it, this is my 10-year anniversary, I found that it boils down to the mental perspective on food and fitness. And I haven't really heard much about that. So I'm curious as to what is your perspective or what work is going on right now to get at the generational psyche of how we see food and fitness. Because everything else can be done, but if you don't change that psyche, it doesn't matter. Well, you know, I, thank you for your very important question. As, as we talked about, I mean, as a result of the obesity epidemic, this may be the first generation of children that's not lives as long and is as healthy as their parents from because of diabetes. So I think that, um, you know, we talk about the individual responsibility and, and there is tremendous individual responsibility to make healthy choices, but there's also extraordinary social responsibility. And, you know, when you're a, an individual who's low income, in, living in a food desert, being bombarded with food marketing, you know, you don't have the government policies, you, you don't have taxes on sugar, you don't have, I mean, a lot of things that, you don't have the transportation to get to a grocery store that has fresh products. You have behavioral economics at, um, at work where grocery stores are putting all of the unhealthy products at the child's eye as they're walking through the supermarket. Um, you know, it's, it's very difficult for that individual. And so we really, again, you talked about multi-sector approaches. In order to change the trajectory and the impact of the obesity and lack of physical activity epidemic in America and around the world, because it is a global issue now, um, we, we really have to make sure that we have agricultural policies that don't favor big agribusiness, 
that we make sure that our, our federal food programs that serve 46 million, dollar, uh, 46 million Americans at a cost of $76 billion, you know, are promoting healthy food choices. Um, that we, again, access transportation. Um, that we address food deserts, that we use technology where we can, um, and that we put an emphasis on education uh, at the individual and at the community level. Um, but that's the only way forward. I would just like to add to that um, the really critical notion of community support and in behavior change. Um, so there is a, another interesting um, work happening in Los Angeles, the program called Grocery Ships. Um, that not only provides some incentives for um, fresh fruit and vegetable purchase, but um, they really do the work in, in community um, with the, the recognition. I think many of us have had this experience before that you know what, what your friend is doing really affects what you are going to do and do you have that support structure in place. Um, Grocery Ships has also spun out uh, a for-profit um, business based on the work that they did um, in building these communities and building these groups in Los Angeles called Every Table, um, which is um, making the kind of the, the accessible food at a price point um, and designing a lot of the, um, the characteristics of their stores and the footprints of their stores to be very consistent with the lived experience of the communities, but the actual food products being, um, you know, culturally appropriate, but also of a different makeup. I also just want to say really quickly, I think it's important to recognize that it, when you're so bombarded with all of these structural issues, it becomes a rational choice to do some of the behaviors that we're observing or trying to undo. Um, that's my first point. But I will say also um, to address your question, I do think that um, it is important to approach your work through a trauma-informed lens. Um, a lot of the work that we're doing not only um, sort of unpacks displacement and segregation and what does it really mean to not have family planning options down the street or having um, not only a health clinic closed but also not have grocery stores and things like that, that really wears on your psyche. And um, so I think that in order to inspire some of the individual and community but also institutional behavioral changes that we're hoping to see, um, we really um, think it's important to prioritize not only doing culturally appropriate and responsive work, but approaching it through a trauma-informed um, care delivery lens. And just want to add um, really, really quickly, the other, the other piece is we have to recognize that certainly as individuals, but overall, right, given you know, a variety, I'm sure, of people who are in this room, we also have to pay attention to the political lens that very often winds up tainting some of these efforts. So I think just of the Let's Move campaign, for example. What is the sound or even legitimate political argument for not continuing that effort? Crickets, right? There isn't one. <laughs> and so literally, if we, you know, we want to talk about efforts that are really geared ultimately at improving the health of kids in theory, kids are the easiest starting point for, for a lot of efforts. It doesn't matter who started it. You know, they're, they're, what, what that movement did in and of itself for getting a lot of kids moving and quite frankly, a lot of adults around kids moving as a result is a starting point. So it may not necessarily, you know, lead to the kinds of, you know, tremendous outcomes that you've had, but it's really getting us moving back in the right direction. But when we have politics coming in and, you know, seemingly shutting down efforts like this, it, 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 it doesn't really help the overall national effort. have one more question. Hi, my name is Nadine Blackwell. I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I agree with much that has been said, but this is what I would like to say, is that it's nice when you see the policies. However, for instance, at the NAACP, with the health component, it's not trickling down to the community. In Philadelphia, I can say we had a really excellent Department of Public Health but with each different health commissioner, it's being whittled away some. But we haven't been able to get our local NAACP involved in maintaining that system and making it stronger. And how do we do that? Um, I'm very, I've been involved with WIC for a very long time as both a teacher and a registered nurse. However, what I saw when WIC started allowing the purchase of juice introduced into a child's diet 
before the age of one, that gives them a taste for sugar. At one time, you could not have juice on wick before age one. So how do you keep big business out of that? Um, how do you keep big business out of the formulas, getting more formulas into the new mothers as opposed to more money into breastfeeding and teaching of that? Um, it's very good that we do have a WIC program, but I do remember when we had surplus too, so nobody could sell it because everybody was getting the same food, and that avoided the waste that we're seeing now. Um, excellent, in Philadelphia, I also work with um, the food banks there and the food trust, but we need expansion of that because to be able to buy fresh produce once during the season with food bucks, we, we don't know a way to expand that, and we're trying to find a way to expand that. We want our school lunches to go back to when the food was cooked in the school. How do we get big business out of that? We, we're trying, but we haven't been able to get a response. The public health, I mean the um, housing in Philadelphia, uh, public housing, as I was speaking to a, a person here, um, it no longer, affordable and low income don't mean the same thing that it used to oh, mean. Know. You know, before I became disabled, I made $85,000 a year as a single woman. With disability, I make 20. But that's 150% over the poverty level. That's insanity. So we do need to have food, as this young lady was saying about your mind and your body. But a lot of people don't have food allergies. What they're allergic to is what they process the food with. You know, I know for myself that I'm not allergic to fruits and vegetables, but when I walk into a supermarket on the day that the fruit and vegetables are delivered, I have an asthma attack because I have to find small farmers who are not using pesticides. I have to use food bucks at the open air markets. So I don't know the intersectionality because there's a lot of division. We have infrastructures in place, but those policies, they're not trickling down. And people who could really contribute to how those policies are made and implemented, we're not at the table. And I want people to see me as a fat, black, nappy-headed woman when I walk into a room because I want all those things to be addressed. So I Thank think you. that when you come to the table, bring people like us right. who have something to contribute. And it doesn't always have to be those of us who have a college education and professional degrees. Mm -hmm. Well, That's I think right. your Thank I you. think your comments <laughs> I, I, th I think your comments bring us back to the purpose of this panel, which is really to you know have the community engagement to listen to the voices of people in the community and to bring together agriculture, transportation, and health, and income and education that they're all intertwined, and we have to do better uh, in order in order to achieve uh, health equity and wealth equity in the years ahead. So thank, thank you, you so much, much. For, for what you said. And to that very point, one of the efforts that we literally started this year, and we, you know, we had to start tomorrow just given the resources that we have available right now, um, and it was self-selection. You know, we, we're working right now with a number of NWCB branches uh, throughout the, the country. Sad, unfortunately, Philadelphia is not one of them, but we'll, we'll talk about that seriously. Is to encourage, well, two things, okay, three things really. One is to talk with them about public policy, what its purposes is and what its power is, right? So that's mm -hmm. one. Two, what social determinants of health really are and how all the, you know, those intersections actually happen. And then three, how to bring in community people. And I'll tell you, across the board, it's interesting, but that's been the one area we think where a lot of the um, affiliates that we've talked to have been like, oh wow, because and, and I don't think that you know our affiliates are alone in this. A lot of community leaders believe that they know what it is that their communities need. But the reality is there are a lot of assumptions even that they can make. They won't necessarily be as negative, obviously, but still the opportunity to be able to involve and engage the community very actively um, in the process of both defining what the challenges are that they want to address and how they want to move forward is something that we really want them to do. So going back to what Shade was saying with uh, community-based participatory research, old-fashioned public health stuff, We've talked with them about these, and they were literally like, y'all gonna be here to like help us with this because we don't know how to do this. And we said, yes, we will. Because it's, it's not necessarily something that's easy, but it is absolutely necessary to make sure that you really have the full voice of the people that you're representing 
that they really are part of the process initially and that you've actually gotten the buy-in from them, you know, right from the beginning. So please know, we, we hear you loud and clear on that. And we are, it's, it's small pieces, you know, small steps, but we really are working on advancing their efforts in, that, in those directions. And I just wanted to affirm what you said. I hear you, and I think that it's so real. I work for an organization that does national research, but I drill everything down and work on very local community-based research projects um, because I hear you. <laughs> and um, I will say um, to make community engagement real and to not just be about inviting a bunch of people to a table to check something off the box, I think it's really important to make sure that that's in your budget and pay folks for attending these meetings, for giving their, and, uh, yeah, for giving their um, intellectual intelligence, for building out these programs. We all get paid for the work that we do, and I think it's very easy for us to, um, you know, get a, a feedback or to ask somebody to fill something out or ask somebody, oh, can you take off or can you spend your time at this meeting? Let's be honest, that stuff is emotionally taxing. It takes time out of your day. You could be looking for a job. You could be working a job that you already have. What ha you could be resting. Um, and so I just think that it's important to make community engagement real is to actually put some dollars towards that. Excellent. And we heard from our colleague just the importance of community voice and how our experiences can help shape policy and program design. I want to thank our panelists, our dynamic panelists. Marjorie Innocent, Dr. Susan Blumenthal, Rinska Lynn, and Shade Adeo. Thank you so much. And this is just the start of our summit. We're going to have a whole lot more um, tomorrow. But just a few housekeeping items. We want to remind you that we have an interactive exhibit outside called Undesigning the Red Line. And so there's a break before we reconvene back here in this room for dinner. And so we encourage you to take that time uh, to enjoy the exhibit, Undesign the Red Line. For dinner, we're gonna have an awesome keynote speaker, Baltimore City Health Commissioner, Dr. Leanna Wynn will be joining us for dinner. And it'll be right here in this room. So please enjoy the break and we look forward to seeing you at six o'clock. <laughs>